before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. On October 1 of 1754, a child was born. This child would go on to be Paul I of Russia, heir to the Romanov dynasty. He was the great grandson of Peter the Great. He was also the three times great grandson of Michael Romanov, the original Romanov to sit on the Russian throne. Even though Paul was destined for Tsardom, he would go on to be considered one of the many mad kings, as well as the Russian Hamlet, because Hamlet is about revenge for the death of a father. Paul I of Russia would also have very strange and peculiar personality quirks, including his obsession with the Knights of Malta. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very, very big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, we would not be able to do what we do. You guys are the original producers and supporters of this channel, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you would like to join our patron or our producer community, there is a link in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. Today in our deep dive into the Romanov dynasty, we're going to be talking about the Mad King Paul I, as well as his obsession with the secret society known as the Knights of Malta. Now, before we get into the deep dive at hand, some of you might notice that I have changed my the angle of my camera. This is because one of the biggest um, complaints that I get is how close I am to the screen when I film, when I regularly film, when I set it up in the regular angle. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot that I can personally do about that because I just don't have space in this room. When I put the camera up at the, the regular angle, it's literally as far on the desk as it can possibly go. And behind me is a wall. And so what I thought I would do is I would just experiment with angling the camera catty corner um, to give more space. and actually gives more space on the desk for my notes as well, but give more space between me and the camera. And I'm curious to see how you guys like it. I am catty cornered. So what that means is I'm not symmetric with the um the stuff behind me my my bookcase like i normally am now i want to hear from you guys because for some of you guys this might really bother you for some of you guys you might like it so i just want to know does this angle work better than the way i was angled before does this help solve the problem of me being too close to the camera let me know your thoughts on that i'm good either way I just want to hear from you guys who are watching which which angle that you like better and if this solves the problem of me being too close to the screen. All right. So with that being said, we're going to be getting into Paul the first Emperor Tsar pa Paul the first of Russia and what a fascinating character this guy was. I have a lot of empathy for him, even though I know he was a little bit of a maniac in in his life. I, I feel like we're going to be learning more about 
Catherine, his mother, in perhaps what was happening behind closed doors in, in the palace by examining Paul. Then we learned about Catherine herself in her own deep dive. Now, with, with that being said, if anybody is new to this channel, welcome. I'm so glad that you are here. The purpose of us going over some of these these people in the Romanov dynasty is so that we are eventually going to get to Anastasia Romanov or Anastasia Romanov, um, the conspiracy around her. You know, uh, that for many, many, many decades now, over a hundred years, it seems, people have um, believed that perhaps Anastasia Romanov was not killed the night that the rest of her family was killed in the Bolshevik Re Revolution. And, um, and so... When I initially went to go cover that, I, I decided in while doing my research that we probably needed to look at the Romanovs as a whole and build up to that night in Russia in the early 20th century when Tsar Nicholas II, his wife, and their five children were executed by the Bolkovich um, in order to cover the conspiracy because this is a very juicy and fascinating family for sure as a lot of monarchies are and as i've said before uh, my friend uh, rocker mike um, from the son of sam chronicles said this with our friend shanti on aquarius rising africa once and i absolutely agree with him sometimes we like to to see things in black and white like there's a good guy and there's a bad guy and a lot of people want to believe that the romanovs were inherently the good guys while the bulkovich were the bad guys and a lot of in a lot of cases that's not true there can be two bad guys fighting it out now with that being said the children anastasia and her siblings are children and all children are innocent especially when they're in a situation that they are in not they're not legally able to consent to so i want to make that very clear but in looking at the Romanovs, I'm, I'm hoping to dispel this idea that there are certain people in this world that can save us because no, 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 nobody in this world can save you but you. And I think a lot of people have this wishful thinking when it comes to like dead celebrities that they're going to pop back up again and all is going to be right with the world and they're going to swoop in and be our saviors. And that's not that's not true. You know, you have to save yourself. And so I, that's why I think it's important for us to look at the background of the Romanovs before we start believing that for some reason this this bloodline is going to come in and like change everything if the conspiracy happens to be true. So with that being said, let's get into Paul the first. I also enjoy this as as many of my longtime viewers know, I am a huge fan of reality TV and our modern world like i love vanderpump rules i love the scandal of it all i love the housewives i love that's my junk food i love my reality tv and that is why i think that i gravitate so more so much towards history and why i did so well in history in in school as a as a kid and up in my upper education because it's these are these are the 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 the, the days of our lives right these were people and this was their life and th these were their scandals and these were the situations that they got themselves in w were humanizing, even if some of these people in history might not have had the best intention for humanity, we're still humanizing them. We're still looking at their lives from all angles of research that we can find. And with Paul, this totally rings true to me. As I've said many times, one of my favorite sayings is two things can be true. Two things can be true. Paul could have been displaying signs of mental disorders as well as extreme PTSD from a but also he could have been a terrible ruler doing some shady stuff. Two things can be true, my friends. Two things can be true. We can have empathy for the child, for Paul the little boy, but also see the accountability for the monster that he turned into as an adult and how that evolution even happened from his upbringing to his assassination in 1801. Paul I of Russia was born on October 1 of 1754 to Catherine the Great and her husband, Peter III. Although he wasn't Peter III at the time because Peter's 
aunt, Empress Elizabeth, was still on the throne. Now, if you missed our previous episodes, I will put them down in the description box below. There's no need to watch them first before this. If you want to, you can, but there's no need. But if you want more details surrounding the lives of Peter III and Catherine the Great, Again, those videos are down below. Now, if you can remember, there was some rivalry between two of the Romanov lines because Alexei, Peter the Great's father, had two wives. The first wife had passed away after giving birth to like her 13th child, and the second wife was the mother of Peter the Great. And Peter the Great and his brother, half-brother Ivan, had co-ruled Russia as co-czars, Ivan then eventually passed away, leaving the throne to Peter. Now, throughout this time, though, Ivan's descendants were also having children. So we have two different family lines, both coming from Alexei, from two different wives battling it out for the throne. And as I've said in multiple of these episodes, I thought the English royal family was bad when it came to the Game of Thrones, but the English royal family has nothing on the Russians. These half siblings were like each other and like poisoning each other just to be able to put a particular bloodline of the Romanovs securely on the throne. And with Empress Elizabeth, it was no different. Empress Elizabeth was the daughter of Peter the Great. And in order for her to make sure that Peter's line stayed on the throne, not Ivan's, because she didn't have an heir, she needed to secure one of her nephews to be her heir. And so thus she selected her nephew, Peter, who became Peter III. Again, Peter was born in a German principality, as was Catherine. That way there were some issues there when they came to Russia with their you know, allegiance actually being German and not Russian. Anyway, but once Peter and Catherine were married, it took about nine years for their marriage to be consummated and we talked all about that last week uh peter was not mature uh, there, there was a lot of medical conditions involved if you want more details in their sex life again that's in the description box below from our last episode on catherine the great but nonetheless in 1754 paul was finally born now we do know that Paul was immediately taken from his mother after birth by Empress Elizabeth. Empress Elizabeth actually favored Paul over her nephew Peter, even though Peter was the next in line for the throne. But with Paul, we have a double security. Not only does Elizabeth now have an heir, but she has an heir to the heir of the throne. So she is like super secure with Peter the Great's line being the dominant Romanov line and not Ivan's line. And I do think that in a lot of ways, Elizabeth, if I'm looking again at her from a very human perspective, again, not saying that she was perfect or an angel by any stretch of the imagination, most human beings live in shades of gray. Elizabeth allegedly had no children. We talked about there being some speculation that maybe she did have a child, but again, that was just conspiracy and speculation. So let's just play dev devil's advocate and say, Empress Elizabeth had no children. So all of a sudden a baby is born. And this is this baby is for all intent and purposes is like her grandchild, even though it's her great nephew, because Peter's mother had passed away and Elizabeth had made her nephew the heir, she acted like a mother to Peter. So therefore, Paul, his son, became almost like her grandchild. And if she did not get the chance to raise a child, this was probably a lot of maternal instincts kicking in to be able to have a baby around her. And I think she felt like because this baby Paul was born in Russia, that she could, in a sense, groom him to be a very strong czar for the Russian people. But this, of course, left a lot of issues with the needs of an infant with its mother. Now, of course, this was the, the the 18th century. So I think we do know a lot more now about the needs of an infant than they did back then. We, of course, now, if you have a baby, they're doing skin on skin contact with the mother and the, the father. There's a lot of understanding about the um, attachment that the child feels with its mother, especially the first few years of life. And there can be a lot of trauma um, subconscious 
unconscious trauma, trauma that the, the human mind can't even remember that can develop if a baby is taken from its mother too soon. I mean, even with animals and on, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a huge animal supporter. I, I rescue dogs in India and I'm also a vegetarian, but when we're look at even, even animals that are bred, which I, I don't really like the breeding process, but we leave the puppies with their mother for quite some time before the puppies are taken. This is very important. And so we're, we're already kind of seeing a crack in, in maybe Paul's mental stability by the fact that he was ripped from his mother. He hardly ever saw Catherine ever as a baby. And even his father, Peter, rarely came to visit him. He was solely guided and nurtured by his great aunt, the Empress Elizabeth. But when Paul was eight years old, his great aunt, the Empress Elizabeth, passed away. Very, very formative time in his life. And after Elizabeth passed away, all hell broke loose. Now, yes, Catherine, his mother, and Peter, his father, did not have a good relationship at all. Like when it comes to arranged marriages and the drama we've seen in, in history of, of people not liking each other in arranged marriages, I think Peter and Catherine's relationship was probably one of the worst. So at, at eight years old, he loses his empress aunt, who was his primary caregiver. His mother and father are now crowned as the czar and the czarina of Russia. And then six months into his father's czardom, his mother overthrows his father to become the sole empress of Russia. Even though Paul did not see his father, Peter, that often, did not have a close relationship with either of his parents, that still has to mess with your mind. To know that one of your parents removed your other parent. And I also want to point out the fact that Paul, as he started to get older, resembled his father, Peter, more and more and more and more. Now, if you remember from our last episode, Catherine did have lovers while she was married to Peter. And in the beginning, these lovers were given to her by the powers that be because they needed her to get pregnant. And so at first there was speculation on whether Paul was actually the son of Peter. But as Paul got older, there was literally, as we say, no denying who his daddy was because he looked just like his father. He also started to develop his father's temperament. And what I mean by this is that it's very obvious that Peter III, his father, probably had some form of mental illness. Now, yes, some of this stuff, as I said earlier, can be results of trauma, of course, like ADHD. There are some mental disorders that you're not necessarily born with, but can develop because of life circumstances. And so I do think that that's part of it. But we also have some other underlying, I don't know, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. There's some other very obvious, maybe heretical issues and the behavior of Paul starts to mimic that of the behavior of Peter long after Peter's gone. And so around this time, it was pretty obvious that Paul's father was genetically Peter, meaning that Paul was a legitimate Romanoff. Now, if you remember from last our last episode over the Romanoffs, we talked a lot about when Catherine removed her husband. A lot of the boyers supported her because they were under the impression that she then would just rule as regent until her son Paul came of age. So around the time that Catherine took the power, Paul was at this point about nine years old. And so this would mean that a lot of the aristocrats, the boyers, believed that Catherine would only rule in Paul's place for about another nine years until he turned 18. And in some of the accounts I read, maybe Paul also kind of was under this impression. And this might have been some of the aggression he ended up having towards his mother as well. But of course, Catherine had no intention 
of ruling simply as regent for her son, she had every intention of being the de facto czar until her passing, just like a man, just like the way his father would have done it if his father had stayed alive. And so around the time that Paul turned 18, there was a lot of stress. There was a lot of attempts on Catherine's life because it became clear to the Boyers that she had no intention of handing the reins over to her son. There's also an issue with bloodline because if you guys know anything, you know these freaking elites love their bloodlines. And Catherine was not a Romanoff. She wasn't. She had married a Romanoff. She had given birth to a Romanoff through Peter, her husband, but she herself wasn't a Romanoff. And so not only were people upset that she wasn't going to be handing over the reins when Paul turned 18 because she was a woman, but she wasn't actually a Romanoff. And so there was a lot of tension. I don't think us in the in the, the normal, the 99% the of us, like in the normal world, us peasants, I don't think we quite truly understand the, the intensity, the tension that surrounded Catherine and Paul and the Boyers at this time. Now, with that being said, there were a lot of Boyers that did support Catherine, especially her lovers, who were getting a lot of perks for sleeping with Catherine, like getting great military positions, given serfs, slaves of their own, given titles and lands and money so of course the ones that supported Catherine they got something out of it so they didn't want things to change they wanted to keep her on the throne now because of this what was already a strained relationship between mother and son became even more estranged Catherine did not trust her own son she didn't really even know her son, let's be honest, but she was very, very suspicious that her son was planning a coup to throw her off the throne, just like she had planned a coup to throw his own father off the throne. So she kept Paul at an arm's length, choosing to keep him at the age of 18 in palaces far away from her just to make sure that she had Paul under control. She would not allow Paul to come into certain meetings. You know, you would think that if you were handing over a kingdom, an empire to your son one day, even if that day comes at your death, that you would want to allow your son, especially if he's older, to take part in political state meetings so that he gets used to understanding how things work so that when he becomes the Tsar one day, he will be more confident in his decisions that he make. But no, 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 Catherine wanted Paul gone. She didn't want him anywhere around her government, any, anywhere around her, her military meetings, nothing. And then she decided the best way to to distract Paul from the fact that there were people that wanted her to step down and her to him to take the reins was to, to find him a girl. So she did find him a wife. We spoke a little bit about this last week. The first wife, her name was Natalia. But three years into Natalia's marriage to Paul, Natalia passed away in childbirth, but the baby itself was also a stillborn. It was a son. And this absolutely devastated Paul. At this point, Paul went into a deep, deep, deep depression. I don't blame him. I think that's very sweet. He obviously had a lot of affection for Natalia, but I know this was probably a little bit strange for the aristocrat or the nobility of any monarchy because most marriages in this group are arranged. And even though there can be some, some type of affection developed between the husband and the wife, in most cases, they're not love matches, they're political matches. So when one of them passes away, there might be a brief mourning, but it's not the devastation of someone losing someone that they truly, truly love. And Catherine didn't, didn't know what to do with this. She had no idea like how to snap Paul out of this doom and gloom. It was true that Paul had suffered from depression as a child. And frankly, the way that Catherine went about this is appalling to me. Catherine claimed to Paul that she had found a box of letters 
that were in Natalia's personal possessions that were between Natalia love letters between Natalia and Paul's best friend, Paul's only friend from childhood. She said this to Paul in order for him to snap, like snap out of it, because obviously the baby wasn't Paul's. It was obviously Paul's best friend. Now, in my opinion, what a bitch. You know, even if this were true, which we don't know if that was true or not, this could have been just a scheme of Catherine's. It's still evil to do. Like, let sleeping dogs lie. The, the woman and the baby are no longer alive why make this even harder for your son? But nonetheless, she did tell Paul that she didn't think Natalia was faithful to him. Maybe she was just trying to hurt Paul even more. I don't know. And not only was she not faithful to him, but again, it was with Paul's only friend. And this is super important because Paul, not only was Paul ripped from his mother at childbirth, but he grew up very isolated from other children. And now we know the importance in 2024 of children spending time with other children. It can cause mental disorders. It can cause crazy making. It can cause, okay, kids need to be able to be around other children in their same age group, in their same development. They, they need to be able to play. They need to, need to be able to use their imagination. And so there was already genetically a propensity for bipolar, for any type of other mental disorders, schizophrenia, then the isolation that Paul spent as a child probably had a lot to do with this, th these issues get manifesting in a, in a more dangerous way, which we'll see when he gets older. But Paul himself was, was very smart. Again, he had private tutors under the Empress Elizabeth. He spoke five languages. He studied literature, history, math, and science. He studied military and combat. He even studied archaeology. And so that one little kid friend that he had that Catherine alleged was his wife's lover, that was the, like a double dagger to Paul's heart. Because not only did Catherine, his mother, imply that his beloved wife had cheated on him and had not given birth to Paul's offspring, but had cheated on him with his one and only friend. Literally, his one and only friend, his one and only contemporary friend that wasn't a tutor or a family member that was a lot older than him. And so at this point, this something snapped inside of Paul at this point, according to a lot of the historians. It was here that we really see a huge turn in Paul. He starts to become extremely paranoid. He doesn't trust anyone. I don't blame him. I, I mean... From the very beginning of his life, he's had no reason to trust anyone because everybody has always stabbed him in the back. And speaking of stabbing in the back, he was very distrustful. He thought his mother was also going to try to remove him physically from this earth plane, which I wouldn't put it past him because Peter the Great, his own great-grandfather, did the same thing to his son. So this is not uncommon in this Romanoff family for parents to to get rid of their own children. And so Paul was extremely, extremely paranoid, alone, isolated, already struggling with depression. And from what I can tell, probably a lot of anxiety. Um, there were some reports from his tutors that said Paul had a really hard time sitting still. Again, this could be a sign of ADHD. I know that I, as an adult, have ADHD, not something that I had as a child, but I do have complex post-traumatic stress, stress disorder, which I've spoken about before. I have very complex anxiety disorders, and it has developed into ADHD, which means that I have a hard time sitting still too. I have a hard, if I'm not working, if I'm not doing something, I start to fall into panic attacks or depression. And again, this is a sign of intense trauma. I know, I know where my trauma comes from, and I can only imagine where Paul Paul's trauma comes from. We also have these signs of neglect and abandonment. Again, he was isolated from other children, wasn't allowed to really play with other children as a child. And there was one horrific story that I read where one of his tutors said that when he was a baby, if he were to, were to perhaps fall out of his crib crying, it was very common for the adults in his life just to leave him on the floor crying. 
when I read that, I wanted to cry. Like, who does that? Who does that? If a baby falls out of a crib, I think most adults would panic and run to the baby and check on the baby and coddle the baby and hug the baby and rock the baby and bring the baby to the doctor and make sure the baby's okay. But the fact that Paul would cry himself in his crib like co toddlers and babies do and roll out of the crib on the floor and no one would come and pick him up. They would just walk in in the morning and he'd be sleeping on the floor. I can't even begin to understand what type of a mental, emotional, and emotional trauma that would cause a human being. Because Paul, as a child, spent a lot of time alone, it became very clear that Paul kind of lived in his own world. He kind of talked to himself, talked to imaginary friends, even as an adult. Now, it is, it is not uncommon for a child to have an imaginary friend that doesn't mean anything. But for an adult to do that is very, very concerning. That's why I perhaps suggest maybe there was a little schizophrenia there. I, I don't know. But nonetheless, um, Paul did have a wild imagination and he kind of had his own little world that he lived in. And part of this world of his imagination was his obsession with the Knights of Malta. Now, in order for us to really look at the Romanoffs, and really look at this family, this dynasty as a whole from the conspiratorial side, we do need to pause for a moment and talk about the Knights of Malta. Now, in this episode on my channel, we're just going to briefly go through the history of the Knights of Malta. However, if you join us at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time today, Monday the 18th of March, we will be talking in more detail about this with Shanti live on Aquarius Rising Africa. That link will be down in the description box below. If you're joining us later than this date, you can follow the link below and watch the replay of that episode if you do want to hear more information about the Knights of Malta. Because as you know, Shanti herself is kind of a, an expert at this point when it comes to these dubious societies that exist around the world. And so I just want to give a brief background because I find this to be fascinating. We know about the Knights Templar. We know about the Priory of Sion. But we also have the Knights of Malta, not to be confused with the Knights Templar or the Priory of Sion, even though these groups allegedly sprung up around the same time. I say allegedly because I'm not 100% convinced that the timeline they give us is the accurate timeline. So the Knights of Malta, even to this day, are a sovereign entity that exists under international law. How terrifying is that? They're a military order, also known as the Sovereign Military Hospitar Order of St. John of Jerusalem, of Rhodes, and of Malta. They also go under the Order of Malta. Now, the, the Knights of Malta emerged, allegedly, during the Crusades. The Crusades were defined as a religious war supported and sometimes directed by the Christian Church. These were military expeditions into the Holy Land to take control of Jerusalem that lasted from 1095 to 1291. At this point, the Europeans involved in the Crusades would literally slaughter anyone who did not proclaim the same faith that they proclaimed through the church. In reality, the Crusades was an empire-building military expedition that used propaganda and division to get the common man to go to war on the church's behalf. The church promised eternal salvation if you fought for them in this war. Now what's really fascinating to me and caught my attention and made me go, huh, you don't say, is that the crusaders weren't just going up against Islam or the Muslims as most of us have been taught. They were also at war against the Jewish people and the Gnostics, the original Christians. 
Now, many of you have been on this journey with me for four years, and you know that we have gone through the missing books of the Bible. We know how corrupted the Bible we have today is. In fact, the Bible we have today is written by the Freemasons. That's a fact. That's not an opinion. That's a literal fact. The real Bible is under the Vatican, hidden from all of us peasants. However, there's been about 50 books that have been discovered that we've read through, and it's a very different story than the story that we've been told in our churches. And so this is kind of where it gets juicy, because what we see with the Crusades, the division, the propaganda, the fake news, the instigation of violence is definitely very similar to what we're seeing today. This group of controllers in the world, these elites, they use the same playbook. They, they only have like one playbook and they keep doing the same things over and over and over again. They're very predictable at this point. But nonetheless, let's continue. Now, what I thought was super interesting, according to a lot of the historians that I researched looking at the Knights of Malta and the Crusades is that about 300 years before the Crusades started, there was actual peace in the Middle East. The Muslims, the Jewish people, and the Gnostic Christians, the, the original Christians, they didn't call themselves Gnostics at this point, they were just the OG Christians, all got along. They saw each other as brethren. They saw each other as cousins. And so there was literal peace amongst them. No one was fighting with anybody. Everybody was respectful of each other. The only time we ever saw any type of, of, of violence was if a pilgrim from the Vatican, the official church, came into the Holy Land. Sometimes there would be scuffles, which makes me wonder if, if there were if they were not being peaceful, these pilgrims, like if they were coming in and trying to like do witch trials or something, you know, I'm trying to think of like modern day Christians, you know, being ag aggressive towards the Islamic people and the Jewish people and the Gnostics, like if that's what caused some of these scuffles, but nonetheless, it, it wasn't anything major. It wasn't like full on battles that were happening around this time for about uh, roughly 700 years, according to the official timeline, starting with the Council of Nicaea in 324 AD, the Catholic Church had taken ownership of all of these manuscripts or these gospels that were written by the Christ and by the people that followed the Christ's teachings. And as you guys know, again, if you've been on this channel for a while, you know that censor they did, they were censoring away, they Throughout over 700 books, Constantine made it illegal for anybody in his empire to own any of the 700 books he deemed illegal. And if any of these people were seen with gospels such as the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of the Nazarene Way, I mean, there's so many. If you were caught with these books, you would be executed. And so a lot of these books were buried um, as we know, in tombs of monks uh, because their life was on the line. And Constantine himself changed the Yeshua story to the Jesus story, which is the Dionysian cult story, which I will put the Dionysian video down in the description box below if you missed that, which is a cannibalistic death cult. And so the whole New Testament became that of the story of Dionysus instead of the story of Yahshua, even down to the fact that Yahshua was never crucified because the real God, the real God doesn't need a blood, blood atonement. Only Lucifer does. So it turned into a very satanic faith. And so we have the Gnostic Christians in the Middle East who are living and breathing the true teachings of Yahshua, the, the books that were banned that they still hold as, as truth in their own books. And then we have this death cult of propaganda coming in from the church to try to take over the Holy Land. We have people, commoners, believing the propaganda of the church, citing rewritten text eroding the real message from Yahshua. The church again was granting salvation to people if they fought, killed on the church's behalf. Gross. And thus in 1095, the first crusade happened. I can't imagine the trauma of the people that lived in the Jerusalem area at that time, not just the Islamic people, but the Jewish people and the Gnostics. I can't, I cannot imagine the trauma that must have been to have people coming into your land and terrorizing you. 
And the sad thing is, my friends, is that there are many Christians I know today who would gladly, they're so bloodthirsty, they would glad they would gladly terrorize another human being for not believing the same thing they believe, which is what's really sad and just shows you how propaganda from the church works. Well, after the first crusade, they sacked Jerusalem and they established what was called the Kingdom of Jerusalem. At this point, the Order of St. John was established, allegedly. I think it actually goes back further than the crusades, but we're just going to work with the information we have. So this allegedly is when this started. Now, technically, this particular order had been in the Middle East since 1048, a few decades before the sacking of Jerusalem, but they really garnished a lot of power once it became the kingdom of Jerusalem. And the order of St. John's kind of started off almost like a hospital service or a hospice service. Maybe kind of in my mind's eye, it kind of sounds like it was more like a hostel, like we call them hostels today. And it was established by the Benedictine monks. Now these monks, I'm not Catholic, so I hope I say it, said that right. I grew up Presbyterian. We don't have, I'm not even consider myself religious anymore, but I grew up Presbyterian. So I, we didn't have monks or anything like that. So I apologize if I said that wrong, but these were the monks that were cloaked in black. Now what I found really fascinating and, and maybe not a coincidence because I find this whole thing to be super nefarious the two saints that are revered today by the Freemasons are St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. So St. John the Baptist was Jesus's cousin who got his head chopped off. And the Evangelist John was the guy who wrote Revelations, according to the Freemasonry Bible. Now the Freemasons revere these two guys. Which is interesting because the J didn't even exist when Yahshua was alive. So, like, who were these people really? Because the name John did not obviously exist. So, I just find that very, very interesting. And the, the Benedictine monks also revere St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. Coincidence? I don't think so, because this order is going to end up evolving into the Knights of Malta. So they were sent to the Holy Land, again, to create like a hospice or a hostile situation for these pilgrims coming from Europe to stay or to seek medical care when they were coming into the Holy Lands. And it really got big during the Crusades because a lot of people needed shelter and needed medical attention. Now, I want to make this very clear. This is very interesting, and it's amazing how they twist history. So the biggest group that was fighting against in the Crusades were the Muslims. Even though there were Jewish and Gnostic people also involved in this, it was the Muslim faith. And what they want us to believe is that the Islamic faith was going against anybody that wasn't Muslim. But that's not true. The Islamic military orders that were heavily fighting in the Crusades were only trying to expel the pilgrims. They were not trying to bother the other Jewish people or the Gnostics. They were trying to get rid of the common enemy that they all had, which was this cabal, Freemason, Catholic Church. That's who they were against. It had nothing to do with people who practiced a different faith. Again, in this area of the Middle East, for at least 300 years, there had been peace between all these three different groups. They, they acknowledged each other as cousins, as family. And so who they were really upset with, who the Muslims were really upset with, was the enemy that is still our enemy today. The controllers. And then here comes this Order of St. John, this, this preamble to the Knights of Malta, setting up headquarters to nourish the enemy. Now, the Order of St. John was established by a man named Gerard. They ended up calling him Blessed Gerard. And he was what they, what they called a lay monk. And what a lay monk is, is, is a, a monk that's also secular, so like somebody who had been in the secular world then maybe like later in life decided to, to join the monastery. Again, I'm not Catholic. All of our, in the Presbyterian church, like all of our administrator people and our preachers, they, they're all married anyway. So this doesn't 
really mean a whole lot to me. But basically, Jared was was like a normal dude who had like lived in the world and been of the world and then decided to like give part of his life to the church. He was born around 1040 and he died on the 3rd of September 1120. And he was from Amalfi. This is going to be very important later on to the Knights of Malta, this connection to Amalfi. Now, I, I find this funny because when I was researching him, a lot of historians now believe that he was a spy. <laughs> I'm like, no shit, Sherlock. Of course he was. Of course he was. Now, around this time, too, the head of the Order of St. John, as it was known then, became what's labeled as the Grand Master. So the Blessed Gerard, as he's called, became the Grand Master of the Order of St. John. The second Grand Master was a man named Ramon de Pew. And by the time the second Grand Master was Grand Mastering of this Order of St. John, this group had gathered so much power that they were literally in charge of everything like they were the mafia just running the show including healthcare. sound familiar my friends sound familiar <laughs> at this point the order of saint john started to use the eight pointed cross which is on the flag of amalfi so i, I told you that's that's where that comes in you might recognize this eight pointed cross on a flag which now is the emblem for the knights of malta now another important date in the evolution of the knights of malta is 1309 because in 1309 the knights of malta or as they were known then the order of saint john took over rhodes island this is an island in greece and they came to rhodes island to build a naval force in the mediterranean now around this time too we see some some scuffles between the this order of St. John, this Knights of Malta, and the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were very wealthy, and so we see the scuffles between the two where the order of St. John, a.k.a. the Knights of Malta, took a lot of money and land from the Knights Templar, making them even more powerful and even more wealthy. Now, again, my friends, two things can be true. Just because the Knights of Malta we're battling it out with the Knights of Knights Templar does not mean that one of these groups was good and one of these groups was bad. In my opinion, there literally is no honor among thieves. The dark side, the dark polarity, the negative side will literally eat themselves alive if given the chance. Once they had the Knights Templar's assets, they were so powerful and they had Rhodes Island and they were building their naval maritime law group. They then decided that they were going to start printing their own money. And not only were they going to be printing their own money, but they were going to create the rules around which this money was used. At this point, the Order of St. John that are going to become come to be known as the Knights of Malta are literally the most powerful force, military force in the world. Now, remember, according to us peasants, they're supposed to be, wink, 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 they're supposed to be a religious organization that helps people in their time of needs. When they're traveling to the Holy Land as pilgrims, when they need medical help, they're supposed to be lowly servants of the Lord. No, they never were. They're a military order, and they still are a military order, which we're going to get to. Now, remember how I said it, at the time of the Crusades, the Islamic group was really targeting these pilgrims, these, these Catholic, violent people that were attacking them. That's who they were against, not the other Gnostics, not the Jewish people, but this other group that was a threat to all groups. Because again, the Crusades, the pilgrims for the Crusades were also slaughtering Gnostics and Jewish people like the, it, it's not just the Muslims thereafter and so over time we see the rise of the Ottoman Empire so around the 16th century the Ottoman Empire still has its eyes here's looking at you 
its eyes on the Knights of Malta or the Order of St. John on Rhodes Island. So in 1522, the Ottoman Empire attacks Rhodes Island and they won. Now the Ottomans have taken control of Rhodes Island from the Knights of Malta or the Order of St. John. You might be thinking, oh, wow, that's great. But no, 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 my friends, the controllers are never going to let a good opportunity go to waste. This allowed the controllers of the world to, to create more propaganda against the Ottomans. Look at those awful Ottomans who are targeting these good Christian people who are here to serve you. Meanwhile, these good Christian people are making money, making the rules. They're dominating everyone. They're bullying everyone. They're in charge of our health care. Do you guys see? I mean, it's so obvious. Like this shit's happening today, too. Once you has, have eyes to see it, you can unsee it. On March 23rd of 1530, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V gave the islands of Tripoli, Malta, and Gazo to the knights. And they're called knights because they're in the military. And if you guys know your history, Charles V, Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V is a big name in history, right? He was the grandson of Isabel and Ferdinand. He was also the nephew of Queen Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's first wife. Like, this dude was connected to everyone. And so the fact that he kind of bowed down to the knights, the Order of St. John, and gave them these islands in the Mediterranean that were owned by Spain is significant. Now we really see who's in charge because you couldn't go a whole lot further in the rank of power than Charles V. So the fact that Charles V is humbling himself in front of these knights means that they're the ones pulling the strings. And it is safe to say that even though they're seven years out from the Ottomans taking over Rhodes Island, <laughs> by the time that they get Tripoli, Malta, and Gazo, the freaking Knights of Malta, as they're now known officially because their headquarters in Malta, are legitimately one of the most powerful institutions our world has ever seen as well as one of the richest. And at this point, it wasn't a secret. They were not a secret society. Maybe what they did behind closed doors was secret, but they themselves were not secret. Now, I believe that Malta was also picked because of stuff that was on the island already. I, I don't think that this group of controllers just randomly picks locations. I think that they definitely know what they're doing. In 1902, on the island of Malta, they discovered the Hypogean. The Hypogean is an underground graveyard, like a catacomb. And in 1902, they discovered up to 7,000 bodies there. The ancient people of the island of Malta had already built these temples long before the pyramids were even built. Now, we've covered some of the catacombs here on this channel. I, once again, I'll place those down in the description box, too, if you're interested in, like, the Paris catacombs. There are definitely a lot of conspiracies around these catacombs. I think catacombs are super weird myself, kind of creepy, although I'd love to tour one. And so I do believe that the Knights of Malta knew that this island was very potent. I think Charles V knew it was very potent, that there was some ancient occultism going on on this island. And so, therefore... This was a strategic place to locate this group of people because after they were located on the island, before anybody was even aware of these underground tunnels and these underground temples from ancient times, the Knights of Malta started to really take part in the building of the capital city of Malta called Valente. And even to this day, I would love to visit this city. Let me know in the comment section below if you have ever visited this city. If you look at the architecture left by the Knights of Malta, there is so many references to occultism. Now, what I find super fascinating too, and again, we can talk more about this with Shanti on Aquarius Rising Africa, is that around this time, the common folk did know that the Knights of Malta had supposedly had a secret elixir of life. 
meaning they had this elixir that you could take that would grant you everlasting life. Now, I, again, find this fascinating because we've heard a lot about certain party drinks and certain liquids that people of a certain group will use to try to stay youthful and perhaps live longer than most of us mere peasant mortals on the planet. I also find this interesting too because we know that with the polarity of light and the polarity of darkness, the darkness can't create anything, only the light can. And so what the darkness does is it takes from the light and it inverts it. And so as someone who has spent a lot of time in India myself on a spiritual quest trying to figure out why the hell we're here, what life all means. I have definitely done a lot of work, internal searching and studying of ancient scriptures to really understand that when people talk about eternal life, they're talking about your soul. They're not talking about the everlasting life of a body. In fact, to try to stay alive forever in your body is not only slapping God across the face, it's also showing God that you don't have faith in, in God or your own soul. And we see this even in the truth or world. We see this like conspiracy around med beds. Is that not another elixir of life? And, and for those that are confused about this, I would definitely say watch out for things that that promise you an external, an external everlasting life. Look at the outfit that you're wearing right now. What if I told you that that outfit was the same outfit you were going to have to wear for eternity? You would probably be pissed. Well, it's the same thing with your body. Your body is merely an expression. It's the Shakti of your soul. It, it's, it's supposed to have an expiration date. And Therefore, when we say death is an illusion, we're not talking about not ever physically dying. We're talking about understanding that your soul is what's eternal, not your body. And your soul has nothing to do with the identity of your body. The identity of your body is just a character that your soul has created to refine itself. And so I would be very careful if you are in the truth or community following anybody that's promising you things like a med bed, that's no different than these other elixirs that these other groups have spoken about. You're trying to defy God. You're trying to defy the existence of your soul. Your soul and your body are two different things. They're two different things. Just like your body and your clothes are different things. What if I told you the car you're driving right now, you had to drive for eternity? No, you can get out of the car and get into a new car, right? So, so I would be very careful. And I do find that people that have that are that really cling to these idea of med beds or really cling and can't can't quite understand this that their body and their soul are different are probably organic portals. Organic portals are fifty percent of the population are are according to the Cassiopeians are organic portals. They don't have souls. They're just walking around in an empty vessel, an empty body. And so therefore they really cannot understand this concept of a soul. Um, I will place one of my videos on organic portals in the description box below as well. So those who have not seen that can can watch that later to understand more about that. So I would just for anybody in this world who is trying to have a spiritual awakening, I would be very, very have a lot of discernment when it comes to things like med beds or elixirs of life. You know, use your body, exercise your body, eat healthy, celebrate your body, love your body, but understand that your body is supposed to be temporary. It was never supposed to be eternal. So again, a lot of the commoners, the peasants knew that the Knights Templar were practicing some sort of magic and were dealing with some sort of occultism. Occultism itself isn't inherently bad. Occultism just means hidden. Some occult stuff is not bad at all. Some is very bad, right? Um, they also, what I found interesting is that the Knights of Malta would pick their Grand Master kind of like the way the Catholic Church picks popes. And that's very obvious by the 68th Grand Master who came known to be Grand Master Pinto. This was a man named Manuel Pinto, and he really... I mean, you know that scene in Hocus Pocus where she's like, a muck, a muck, a muck, a muck. That's what I think about when I think of Grandmaster 
Pinto, he was like, amok, 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 amok. He really got deeply involved into occultism with the Grand Master. He even like expelled the Jesuits from Malta in 1753, a year before our lovely Paul was born, so that the Knights of Malta had total control over this particular island. Now, again, the Jesuits are just bad news bears all around. But again, doesn't mean the Knights of Malta are good. Two things can be true. The Jesuits can be bad, and the Knights of Malta can be bad. Two things can be true here, you guys. No honor amongst thieves. They're going to fight each other out till the bitter end. So Pinto was a very fascinating person. Again, we'll talk more about him on Aquarius Rising Africa. I will mention, though, that Manuel Pinto still has descendants alive today. Speaking of the Knights of Malta today, let's talk a little bit about these, these, uh, this adorable group of people. Only nobles can join you guys, like even to this day. And I got most of this information, y'all, y'all, I got most of this information off of their own website. And that's how you, 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 this group, these controllers, these nefarious ones, they have to tell you what they're doing. So if you literally just look on their website, sometimes it's like Somerset Belanoff's website, Glam's Castle website. She puts everything out there, right? You, you can, you, that's how, you know, they wrote the freaking Bible. It's on their damn website. You know, like it's, it's not that hidden, right? We just, we, we just don't look. They, and they hope you won't look, but I, I look because I'm because I'm a nosy bitch. So I'm I'm a petty nosy bitch. So I'm going to look right. So they're still around today and only true nobles can join the Knights of Malta. Now, there are some splinter groups that are like, LOL, wink, wink from the controllers. Yeah, you can join these groups. but They're not real. The real group, the real Knights of Malta. That's only reserved for certain bloodlines. Now, the Knights of Malta in our modern time were also the group that was responsible for moving the Nazis, Operation Paperclip, um, after World War II, getting some of them to Argentina. Some came to the United States. Some went to Russia. They also are responsible for creating the three-letter agencies here in the United States and in the United Kingdom and other three-letter agencies in other countries. You guys know what I mean by that. Can't say it on YouTube. Those are the Knights of Malta. Starts with the C in our country. Those are your Knights of Malta. The Knights of Malta specifically are taught and trained in the occult from a very, very, very young age. And a lot of the Knights of Malta that are not public personalities like our presidents all that kind of stuff the ones that are low-key knights of malta but run within these circles are indeed also spies still for the vatican so basically i heard one historian who's not a fan of the knights of malta say we have been in a thousand year battle literally with the knights of malta starting with the crusades leading up to this very day we have been in a war against the knights of malta humanity has and it's up to us who wins that battle. The battle isn't over yet. So I just thought that was super, super fascinating. Again, we'll talk more about that, probably get into more of the occultism with the Knights of Malta over on Aquarius Rising Africa. Another thing before I forget, before we return back to Paul and his association with the Knights of Malta is the Knights of Malta who allegedly have no nation of their own have a seat at the UN. They also have embassies in countries, even though, again, they don't have their own country now. And in 2017, I have to be careful about how I say this, but you guys will know what I'm saying. In 2017, there was a huge breach of emails that were released from a particular political party here in the United States really taught us a lot about what's really going on with the powers that be. And the Knights of Malta were spoken about in those particular emails that were associated with a particular um, political party here in America, the party of the donkey. You guys know, know what I'm saying. So there's that. Now, let's get back to Paul I of Russia, his obsession with the Knights of Malta, and the, the, the part he's going to play in the Knights of Malta up to his assassination. 
But before we do that, I just want to take a brief moment to hear a word from our sponsors. Our sponsors mean, our patrons and our sponsors mean so much to me because without our sponsors, without our patrons, I literally would not be able to do this. So I'm so grateful um, for our sponsors. If you are interested in the product, I've been using the product for over a year, a year now, the ASEA product, and it has literally helped me so, so, so much. So there is a phone number down in the description box. You can text Bryce info to to get more information about the ASEA product, but you'll see, you'll see in the commercial. So let's get on with the commercial before we get back to Paul. If you've been on this channel for a while with me, you know that I am a firm believer in the power of food. The power of food being your medicine and being your spiritual source of an energy supply. After all, matter or nature is the Shakti of consciousness. It is the Shakti and the expression of the soul. If you've been on this channel for a while, you know that I very much promote a plant-based diet along with the Ayurvedic system of knowing what your actual dosha is. With that being said, in my life, in my adult life, I have have tried many many supplements before and you guys know that I am a huge fan of the ASEA redox supplement the, the liquid as well as the gel but did you also know that ASEA has a vitamin line that's right it's called the ASEA via there are four different types of supplements that ASEA is offering this one is the source which is whole food and micro nutrient complex. They also have Life Max, which supports a healthy lifestyle. They also have an Omega and they have a probiotic. Now, again, with this being said, I am very much a snob when it comes to supplements. Again, I've, I've been using supplements for a very, very long time because early on in my adult life, especially with my yoga career with Ashtanga Yoga, I realized again how important the value of nutrients were to your overall spiritual health. The body is energy and food is energy. And if we're giving our body the correct energy, just like you give your car the correct energy, the correct gas, then your body, your mind, your well-being will work better for you. Now again, yes, there are lots of supplements out there that are frankly crap. And I was not going to actually try the ASEA supplements when I first started using ASEA because I was health happy with the supplements I had been taking. But one day I was on their website and I was like, you know what? I'm actually just going to try it. I'm going to order these vitamins and I'm just going to see how I like them. My boyfriend also is the same of me. He himself is very skeptical of supplements. He's been doing supplemental work for literally 30 years now. And so for him, he too was skeptical. Well, the first supplement we got was the source. In this supplement, it has spirulina, alfalfa leaf juice, wheatgrass juice, barley grass juice, oat grass juice, pomegranate juice, ossi berry juice, raspberry juice, blueberry juice, cranberry juice, grape juice, goji berry juice, sea kelp, broccoli, cabbage, parsley, kale, dandelion, and broccoli sprouts. It says on the box, a food-based micronutrient complex with a unique blend of superfoods, which a lot of what I just read to you is considered a superfood, as well as plant extracts and trace minerals. Now again, once I got the bottle, I was still a little skeptical. I again am a creature of habit and I liked the supplement I was on. But right when I opened this, I could smell the potency of the capsules inside. I knew the minute I opened this, this was going to be good. The same thing with the Life Max. Now for me, I do struggle with inflammation because I do have a propensity to have some arthritic flare-ups. This has a lot of turmeric in it and turmeric is nature's anti-inflammatory. Basically, it's like nature's ibuprofen. And as it says on the back that this is designed to counter the negative effects of aging. This supplement contains natural herb extracts, which increase energy levels, support the immune system, and promote healthy inflammatory responses, support joint health, and promote a healthy, more youthful appearance. Now again, these two, in my opinion, are the Mac Daddies. And I will say, two days after my boyfriend being on these supplements, he came home from work saying that 
he could not believe the amount of energy he had that day he was so impressed by the quality of especially this one of these vitamins that there was no way he would ever go back to the vitamins that we were originally taking now if you go to the ASEA website which will be linked down in the description box below you will see this little category of cell nutrition just click on that below and you will see all the different vitamins here once again if you click on the individual vitamin vitamins you can see more details about each vitamin now as you guys know or if you've been on this channel for a while you know I am a vegetarian the Omega does have extracts from the fish um, which obviously a lot of Omega uh, products do have fish in them but from what i have heard so i don't take the omega but from what i have heard from people who do take the omega their biggest biggest takeaway from a sia's omega is that they're not left with a fishy taste in their mouth for the rest of the day now i personally am hoping that one day a sia will make an omega supplement that is good for us vegetarians just like they have done with their collagen radiance they've made the collagen radiance vegetarian friendly so anyway guys just another wonderful thing that is brought to you by ASEA if you are interested or want more information on the vitamin line or any of ASEA's products please text Bryce info to 321-216-8047 again that's Bryce info to 321-216-8047 if you are contacting Jay from a country outside of the United States, make sure you let him know that and make sure you add a plus one to his phone number. That is our country code. And make sure you double check that the vitamin line is available in your country. That will have to do with whatever red tape ASEA has to go through with your health and, and administration with your government. So just double check on that. It is available in the United States. I think it's available in most countries at this point. But again, for more information, text J, text Bryce info to 321-216-8047. If you're already sold on these vitamins and you want to try them, I will put a link down in the description box that takes you directly to the vitamin so it makes it easier for you just to quickly purchase. If 30 days goes by and you're not happy with the product, ASEA will offer you a full refund, no questions asked. All right, you guys, with that being said, back to our show. All right, so now back to paul so we know from our last episode that catherine the great paul's mother passed away in 1796 she she was 67 years old she had a stroke basically now what's interesting is that in in 1777 paul and his second wife had the first of what would be 10 children. And this was their son, Alexander, who we're gonna speak about next week. Now, Catherine had done to Paul what Empress Elizabeth had done to Catherine. She took Alexander in 1777 from Paul and his second wife right away, and she raised Alexander as her own. In fact, she was so proud of Alexander that she had created in her will that when she passed away, that the, the line of succession would skip Paul and go directly to Alexander. Now, the funny thing about Alexander, as they say, is that he had the brains and the power to be the czar, but never wanted to be the, the czar, which again, we're going to cover him next week week because there is a big conspiracy around him which I'm excited to talk about with you guys but nonetheless when Catherine passed away passed away unexpectedly in 1796 of a stroke the minute Paul got word that his mother was dying he rushed to her palace not to say his goodbyes but to find her will once he found her will he allegedly burned the will so that Paul by law would be crowned the czar and not his son, Alexander. Alexander would still go on to be Paul's heir, but Paul was bred to be a czar. He had put up with a hellacious life up to this point, and now it was his turn to sit on the throne. And sit on the throne he did. In, in 1796, he became Paul the first, Tsar Paul the first of Russia. Now, again, with Paul's 
the world of his own imagination, his obsession with the Knights of Malta, he took a lot of his quirks out on the Russian military, which is also very similar to his father, Peter III. If you remember from Peter III, from our discussion, he loved his toy soldiers. He was obsessed. He would work his military basically to the death. And, and again, Paul was no different. In fact, he would he was obsessed with parades. And so he would march and march and march and march and march his soldiers in a parade every single morning. And there's a particular high step that the Russian military still does to this day that comes from Paul I of Russia. He was obsessed with perfection, which to me is a sign of OCD. He would make his soldiers every morning put their pants on wet so that they would dry without any creases on them. He would also have them march with a glass of water on their head to make sure they were standing in a perfect, perfect attention and perfect alignment. There was even a contraption that people talked about that he would put his soldiers in to like make sure they were perfectly presentable. If anything went askew with the soldiers, Paul would have them beaten. It was not, not a fun life to live under Paul, that is definitely for sure. When Paul became czar, he also revoked a lot of his mother's laws, just to spite his mother. He created what's called the Pauline Laws of, of Russia, which will come into effect when we get to Anastasia Romanov and Nicholas II, the last video we're going to do with that whole conspiracy. And the Pauline Laws basically stated that the only person that could inherit the throne from a czar was the next son. So whether that's the son or the grandson, the next in line. So if a czar only had females, but the female had a son, it would go directly to the oldest grandson, but it would never skip a generation. So if a czar had a son, it would go to the son first and then that son's children. So, and this was because of, of the trauma that I'm sure Paul had experienced under his mother being the empress, whatever happened with Empress Elizabeth. And then of course, with his mother trying to skip him for his own son. So these are the Pauline laws that existed again up into the modern time with the last czar of Russia and why we had the predicament with Alexei, Nicholas's the second son. It all comes from this. So, so from Paul I of Russia, the mad king of Russia, we not only have the, the, high, the high step of the military that Russia is known for, but the Pauline laws that really play heavily into, into the fall of the Romanovs in the early 20th century. He also went hard on the nobles, which I kind of applaud him for. He, at this point, the nobles had been exempted from taxation. So the only people being taxed were the peasants, the, the, the little people, and the nobles had no taxes. And so he ended that, meaning that the nobles had to pay taxes now. He also made the nobles eligible for capital punishment. So before... Now, these nobles who were allowed to, like, kill their own serfs, their own slaves, now were also under law eligible for capital punishment if they did something wrong. So, so from the very beginning, Paul is definitely making an enemy of himself to the boyars, the aristocracy, which is interesting because a lot of the aristocracy, again, at the beginning of his mother's reign, supported him and wanted Catherine to hand over the reins of, of Russia to him when he turned 18, which she didn't do. But now he's got a huge target on his back. He was also very frugal. And so he got rid of a lot of the state's employees. And because of that, there was not enough people in the state government to get work done. And so Russia started to kind of fall into dis dis disarray under Paul, definitely started to kind of fall apart, but because he just didn't have the employees, he got rid of most of them. He it was super paranoid. He stopped sleeping. He, it's, it was it said that Maria, his wife, would walk the halls with him at night because if she didn't, he would talk gibberish to, to the guards. You know, he was literally falling into his own little paranoid world. Well, in 1798, the Knights of Malta and Paul, their worlds collide. Now Paul's getting to live out his 
fantasy. The island of Malta was taken by Napoleon in 1798, so two years after Paul had become the czar. And again, Paul's obsessed with the Knights of Malta, really wants to become part of this group, probably because he just wanted a damn family. So he reaches out to the Knights of Malta and tells them that he will offer them priories and land in Russia for their new home. Now, what's interesting is that the Knights of Malta are definitely a Catholic organization. But Paul is Orthodox. Well, that didn't matter. Rules for me, but not for thee. The Knights of Malta took Paul up on his offer and took some of the land in Russia as their headquarters. And because of his offer, they made Paul the 72nd Grand Master. Now, there's also a lot of speculation about where the headquarter of the Knights of Malta are today. Some people believe that the headquarters of the Knights of Malta are now in Italy. But some people actually believe that the headquarters in Italy is nothing but a decoy. Just like the pyramids of Egypt and Africa is nothing but a decoy. The real Egypt being here in the United States. In fact, a lot of people believe that the real headquarter for the Knights of Malta is in Pennsylvania. But nonetheless, I digress. All of a sudden, Paul I, the mad king of Russia, gets to be his, you know, he is imagine his wildest dreams have come true. He's czar. He's finally czar after 42 years on this planet. He's czar. And then at 44 years old, two years into his Zardom, he gets to be the Grand Master of the Knights of Malta. He is just Grand Mastering and Zaring all over the place. But again, even though this is good news for him, something he's always dreamed about and wanted, mental I issues will do what mental issues do. And as I've said, his paranoia just got worse and worse and worse to the point where the country was literally falling apart. And the nobles decided that they needed to take, remove him, that they, they were going to have to remove him from the throne. Now, it is stated that Paul kind of knew that he something was going to happen to him. Uh, he had written some letter uh, only to be read, like a time capsule, only to be read 100 years after he passed away. Um, I don't know what was in this letter, but apparently there was this priest that was imprisoned in russia because this priest was known to be a prophet and i mean we'll talk more about this priest on aquarius rising africa but he had prophesized some pretty wild stuff like reading some of the things that this priest had prophesized it's his psychic abilities that said was going to happen i mean it's better than nostradamus in my opinion and the priest got himself imprisoned because he had prophesied the death of Catherine the Great. And you can't, that's the thing about when you got a monarch, you can't talk about the death of the monarch. That's a crime. And so him prophesying the death of Catherine the Great landed his ass in jail. Well, Paul and his paranoia went to go visit this priest named Abel. And Abel told Paul that his reign would be a very short one and that he would be strangled. He even told Paul the date, March 11th, 1801. Now, the thing about it is, is the nobles had worked with Alexander, Paul's son, in a way to remove Paul from the throne. Alexander was far better suited to rule Russia. He was smart. At this point, there didn't seem to be any mental issues with Alexander. Again, we'll talk more about him next week. Some things are just hereditary, but at this point, Alexander was way more stable than his own father, Paul. And Alexander basically said to the, to the nobles, do what you got to do, but do not touch a hair on his head. Get him to abdicate. If you won't abdicate, just lock him up for a minute. I'll come talk to him, but do not hurt him. <sighs> but we're dealing with the Romanoffs, aren't we? So the night of March 11th, um, it's, it's weird because in all accounts, it seems that Paul was pretty calm. Like he knew his death was coming, but it was almost like he accepted it. I kind of felt bad for him hearing multiple accounts of the night of March 11th. Twelve different noblemen broke into the palace after dinner and 
Paul did fight them off and he, he held his own for a while, but they ended up strangling him. He was assassinated in 1801, ending a five year reign. At that point, his son, Alexander I is now de facto the czar, but there's a crazy conspiracy around Alexander the first. And we love our conspiracies. So next time we're going to talk about the conspiracy around Alexander the first. Thank you guys so much for sitting through this very juicy, juicy reality show called history. And again, let me know what you think about the setup with this camera. If you like this better, um, if not, I'll go back to the way that I normally film. I hope you guys are having a wonderful, wonderful day. Do not forget to join us if you can uh, for our live show this morning at 10 a.m. on Aquarius Rising Africa. Again, a link to Shanti's channel will be down in the description box below so that you can join in the fun and join in the conversation where we can go a little bit deeper into these juicy, juicy stories about our own collective past. All right, you guys, I'll talk to you all soon. Bye, everybody.